Hello to the Chicas and hello to the Chicos. Um, back to MSR, my students rock. Um, I've got some real treat for you. It's because all my students present real treats all the time, every time. This time around, we are going to dismantle, destroy and absolutely eliminate the Karakan defense, uh, the one that is very famously known for just pawns and no hope. But uh, to be a little bit more serious about it, there's nothing wrong with the Karakan, uh, as long as it's someone else who's playing it and not you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Karakan is totally fine. In fact, um, Irvin Lamy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, the Dutch dude, has made a absolutely amazing uh, chessable course not long ago. So for the Karakan aficionados, uh, I would like to point you towards the direction of Irvin. He will tell you how to do this. Um, but now we are not here uh, to celebrate the Karakan once again, but to destroy it. And that's exactly what my student Octavian does. I feel like there is a bit of an energy going on here. I was watching this morning a little bit of um, Morris Ashley streaming and uh, dude, that guy really knows how to present. He's such a, such a cool dude. And uh, yeah, once you see him, you feel like you can do it too. You can't, of course, because there is one and uh, only Morris Ashley. But still, I feel like that energy and I would like to put that in uh, into this video too. So mainline Karakan and here I really like my students to play bishop f4 instead of bishop d2 although technically there is not an awful lot that is different if you in fact look at the computer lines which I'm going to eliminate because I don't want to distract you they come up as equal now the reason why I prefer bishop f4 is because in my opinion and I could be wrong so once again talk to Irvin about this black's best move here is queen a5 forcing the bishop back to d2 and then dropping back the queen to c7 which is essentially the same as us going bishop d2 and then going b queen c7 knight here and castles. But the way I see it is the following. If you play bishop f4, in my opinion, black's best move is queen a5. So here we are giving black an opportunity to go wrong and wrong he goes, in my opinion at least, because he plays in knight d7. The reason why I call it wrong is because it's quite important for black to actually take control of this diagonal by having a queen here and a bishop here in a number of lines. It's a little bit harder to um, execute certain plans um, if the queen and bishop respectively are on um, more passive squares than c7 and d6. Anyway, long story short, we castle queenside because that's what good chess players do. Um, knight d5, bishop drops back to d2, all g, a5. Now, still we are in the realm of reasonable moves, um, but I, I'm not a big fan of a5, although the engine doesn't mind it, but I'm getting a bit nervous about the king, the development, and the fact that I don't believe in this queenside pawn march up story. You can't really do that successfully at least until um, uh, you are fully developed. Bishop b4 was played. I think this is not really great. Student plays c3 and then student plays rook e1. Now from here on there were multiple points in the game where we potentially failed to execute a very important maneuver. And so if you are a player who plays the Karakan is white, Always remember that once you are done with development, more or less, this piece here is your problem. Because this has no future whatsoever. We hate that g3 knight. We had to drop it back in the beginning because it has nowhere else to go. But as soon as you can, I highly recommend you to consider redirecting it towards the center. And don't even worry if you have to trade it off for one of the knights. Because currently the black knights are doing both of them reasonably well compared to g3. What it also allows you to do is to launch an attack with g4, g5 against the king that is very likely to castle here rather sooner than later. Anyway, uh, rook e1 was played b5. That is kind of to prevent c4. Which is why, by the way, c4 here was also quite a good move. And now, again, this was the golden opportunity to chuck in knight e4, and uh, white would be doing pretty well there. Instead, we went rook e2. Now, this is a little bit slow, a little bit caveman-y uh, for my liking, but what student is about to execute here, Octavian, the butcher from Chachak, the way I like to call him, is uh, 
to double up on the E and then all kinds of dirties are going to come in. Uh, B4 was played, a very poor move because it allows, in fact, forces white to play C4, which is something we want him to do. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. So in the white trunks, my student Octavian rated 1809. In the black trunks, his opponent, Harkov underscore 71, rated 1945. So almost 150 rating difference to the opponent's favor, which is, by the way, something that I do tell to a lot of my students. But unfortunately, not all of them quite like doing that, which is to play up more often than not. And playing up by 150 in my book is totally okay. He doubles the rocks and the engine goes, yeah, nah. And I will tell you why the engine says that uh, in a second. Once again, 94 was the way to go with G4 coming and attacking. The problem with rookie one is, is that it seemingly prepares knight f5 and potentially rookie six, as we shall see very soon. But after castles, knight f5 actually loses all its power due to takes rookie seven and 94. Now that's a very ugly way to rain on someone's party, but that that's what it is and for this reason this rook doubling came a little bit too late but we have got an opponent who is uh, now allowing us to do something extremely beautiful and this whole concept alone made me so happy because his student goes knight f5 nay bang boomski baby exploding that rook is just chugged in into the enemy's face as if it was worth nothing. And now the attack against the king gets very, very real. And after queen g6 check, king f8, student goes rook e6. And boy, what a saccharino. Like we're not talking about force mate here at all. In fact, we had one check, check even. And then we just casually take a, a pawn with the rook. We had a full rook down. And we apparently have not created any instant threats. It feels like black can do whatever he pleases. And yet the now total boss knight on g3 is about to create the most monstrous threat by knight f5, which is essentially unstoppable. And black can only manage here the trouble and the damage that is yet to come. Now, once again, it's like, yeah, mate. You are my student and I am a proud, happy coach. Um, the real genius behind the idea actually couldn't quite come to the fore because after rook takes e6, black uh, made a horrendous mistake. Essentially, every single move here that is not queen e8 would fall in that category. Play b3, I will show you this first. And after knight f5 now, it's just falling apart. Check, king took, pawn up, check, king here. And um, just a little, little tiny detail that I wish it hadn't happened. Here, student played rook takes e7, forcing mate in two, instead of the absolute stunner. Look at that mate. Oh boy. But whatever. A force mate is a force mate. A beautiful attack. Absolutely fantastic game. And on its own right, just for this, it deserves to be brought into my student's rock. But check this out. After Queen E8, we have got an absolutely breathtaking and beautiful idea, which is Knight F5 allowing the Queen trade and actually forcingly entering an endgame scenario where we are a full rook down and totally winning. And this is what makes this game so amazingly cool. That here black actually has no way to come this uh, to bring this rook out of the game. And actually, at this point, I can't help but uh, bring up an analogous idea for you. Um, the world famous Morozevic uh, MVL Maxim Vashie Lagrave game featured a very similar idea. I will go quickly through, and now you understand why I brought up the analogy. I really like analogies and connections between things that we have seen. And this game is probably one of the most irrational games of chess I've ever seen in my life. I highly recommend you to look it up. Um, like this this game, what this game doesn't have doesn't exist in chess. Like look at that. Rook h7. 
and taking it is actually a mistake because that allows the rook to come out uh, the knight to come out but wait for it because we are about to have two black queens on the board in a second Tuck, 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 tuck. I'm just speeding through because I don't even want to attempt I get half of what's going on. Oh, that's right. Two black queens. No worries. We'll take one of them. Thank you. And black is still hardly winning here. He's eventually going to come up out on top. But look at this. He still can't get out of here. That's absolutely amazing. And now he manages to un or disentangle himself with this. And now we have to take, and even breaking down this barrier was uh, a bit of a trickery for uh, MVL, but eventually he succeeded because it's very difficult to get out with the rock and then start pun munching on pawns without allowing that. But uh, somehow he managed to do this. And that meant, so this was a kind of a zugi here because uh, he was about to get mated. Anyway, I don't want to take too much credit away from my student by showing the MVL game instead of this. So what's going on here is that now this bishop is hanging. And if the bishop goes here, we take the bishop. Sorry, if the rook goes there, we take the bishop, we take this pawn, and now we're threatening to take this. And black is just dead. Full rook up and has got nothing. Like we already have got 75 pawns exactly for the rook. And um, black just can't come out. These two guys are here for the rest of eternity. I mean, he can attempt doing this, but there is no more. That's the end of the story. And I can already jump on that with bishop d2. And eventually the too many pawns are going to succeed and win the game. So once again, I will show you the beautiful tactic. Rook takes e6. That was amazing. Takes check, rook takes. And now once again... Knight f5 is absolutely brutal. I really like the line with rook a5, where you don't even play knight f5, allowing black to take. No, 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 no. d5. Thank you very much. You are not taking f5. I need that piece. And now after cd5, knight f5 again, the black position is absolutely falling apart. Mate on g7, e7 is hanging. G to the g on your bike. Beautiful chess. And so, yeah, he needed to play here queen e8. The finish once again was absolutely breathtaking. Takes, 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 and mate. An absolutely awesome game. And actually, the time control was 2010. So when usually what happens is with rating gaps that the larger the time control, the more likely the rating gap is going to be um, seen uh, in the game. And here we can safely say that black got absolutely outplayed and destroyed. Like he didn't even have a shot at uh, staying in this game. Here queen e8 is a tremendous blunder. I would have expected a 1900 to find that, but uh, even then they would have lost the game um, in that very, very interesting end game scenario. So this is folks how my students rock and how you dismantle the Karo Khan. A really, really superb attack. Congrats to Octavian for scoring this beautiful victory. I'm going to chuck this game and the MVL one as well um, in the description if you want to look them up again. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I will be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.